The following is an abridged version of a talk given by Reverend Clarence Jordan, co-founder of Koinonia Community near Americus, Georgia, on November the 10th, 1956, at Fellowship House, Cincinnati, Ohio. Mm -hmm. well, uh, I want to first express my very deep gratitude for the warm reception which you have given me here, for the friendly and hospitable spirit in which you have received me. It uh, touches me very deeply to be in such a, a spirit of fellowship here with you uh, this afternoon. Now, uh, perhaps I could speak for a while, giving you something of the background, as uh, Reverend McCracken has indicated, and then maybe uh, have some time left for uh, questions from you that uh, you might wish to raise. Now, if I should uh, speak too long, maybe somebody can call me down. I, I think maybe you might frequently have wished, as have I, that uh, you might have some instrument by which you could control the speaker in the length of time that he uh, would speak. Somewhat like the other day, I was out with my little three-year-old boy. He wanted to go with me to round up the horses, uh, the cattle, and I was going out on the horse, and he said, I can go. I said, well, you'll have to ride up behind me there, behind the saddle. And he said, well, that's all right. So I threw him up behind me, and he was perched high up on the horse's hips. And as we went through the pasture, every now and then the horse would reach way down and get a bite of grass. And that, of course, would elevate Lenny a little bit. And... Uh, that kept up about three or four times, and finally he observed. He said, Daddy, guess what? I said, what? He said, I'm sitting on a bone that reaches all the way to that horse's mouth. <laughs> uh, now, I, I, if, uh, you might not have a bone, but maybe you've got an arm that can reach this far and control this uh, mouth. Uh, a little later on, we got to trotting, and he said, Daddy, can't you find a little smoother ground <laughs> Uh, uh, I shall not go into all the background of this, for it would perhaps be too long a story. Suffice it to say that, that I grew up in the state of Georgia and very early became aware of a, of a tremendous struggle going on in the hearts of people. I saw it in the life all about me. There, there were people who were professing a loyalty to Jesus Christ, and yet there was an unrest there. Uh, he, he would teach men to love one another as themselves. He, he would teach that, uh, that red and yellow, black and white, all are precious in his sight. And, and yet, that was not a reality. And in my own home, there was always that tension uh, between the gospel of Jesus and the environment in which we found ourselves. Uh, as I grew up, I, I wanted to try to reconcile that into a whole, and growing up in a rural area, I decided to go to Ag College and try to come back to my people and, and unite them uh, somehow or another uh, in Christian love and brotherhood. Later, as I finished the University of Georgia, I became aware that men do not live by bread alone, but by those words proceeding from the mouth of God. And I went to the Southern Baptist Seminary to learn what those words of God might be. All the while dreaming of the time when I could go back to Georgia and, and seek to, to set up a fellowship uh, that would be true to those things that, that were taught by him. In 1942, this became a reality when another uh, family, Martin England and his wife and children, uh, who were from South Carolina, also had something of this same vision. So we went down and found an old, run-down 400-acre uh, farm in the southwestern part of Georgia. Now, we didn't choose that particular farm for any reason other than that it seemed to us to be fairly typical of the whole South. The white Negro population ratio was about typical of the whole South. The old farmstead was about what you would find anywhere in the South. It was a fairly typical average situation, and that's what we wanted. For well, we felt that we would be experimenting, and an experiment would be, worth, uh, would be of value only insofar as it was carried out under typical conditions. 
We had agreed on several fundamental principles. One was that as we, as we read the New Testament, it became clear to us that God is the Father of men irrespective of their race. And we agreed that we would hold to that, regardless of the consequences. Second, we agreed that, that the way of Christ was not the way of, of nonviolence, but the way of active goodwill. Uh, I might digress a little bit there to say that I don't believe in nonviolence. These white citizens' councils are applying a tremendous amount of nonviolence against Koinonia right now. There's a little bit of violence going along with it, but uh, on the whole, they're depending upon the boycott, which is nonviolent. Uh, Jesus taught more than that. It was not just non-violence, but it was active goodwill. And so we, we agreed to, uh, to commit ourselves to actively uh, trying to, to love even those who uh, were opposed to us and to overcome their evil by doing good. And I could cite you a lot of in, uh, opportunities that we've had along that line. And then for uh, third, we committed ourselves to the equality of the believers economically and otherwise. So that meant, of course, having a common place. Uh, it meant the renunciation of all personal property. Uh, into our fellowship, we would accept people as equals, but we could not see how they could come in if, if property were dividing them. So one of the requirements for membership in our group is that you have no earthly possessions. Jesus said it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom. We haven't even had one to apply, but uh, we, uh, uh, we, we just don't want to have, have him to have any trouble entering it, so we just unload him at the door. Uh, uh, now, now um, things, property, uh, have a tremendous ability to uh, separate people, and so we, we wanted to get rid of that divisive uh, wall that grew up between people. Uh, between the rich and the poor. And uh, we just felt that if we were going to be one family, if we were going to be one family, that we would pool all that we had and make distribution on the basis of need and not on the basis of greed or knowledge or power or skill or influence. So those three basic things we felt were important. With those things in mind, we, we went to this old rundown farm and started in. We had hardly uh, gotten on the place when we had some Negro visitors, and we invited them right in. We are very happy to have them, and we sat down and ate, and uh, we could not control who came and who went, and about the same time some white neighbors dropped in, and uh, they saw what was going on right there in South Georgia, and their mouths dropped open. It reminded me of the entrance to Mammoth Cave there. <laughs> Uh, well, I knew there would be some trouble after that, and a day or two later, some couple of gentlemen came, uh, said that they were, were, had been sent by the Ku Klux Klan, which at that time was not uh, defunct, and uh, they said, uh, we want to come right to the point, will you? Uh, we want to let you know that we don't let the sun set on folks that do things like that here. And... Uh, I uh, put on my broadest smile and uh, stuck out my hand and said, Well, I'm just so happy to meet you. All my life I wanted to meet some people who had power over the sun. <laughs> and uh, uh, I said, we, we will be watching it with great interest tonight. Uh, and sure enough, the sun did go right on down as usual. Uh, no Joshua there at all. Uh that was about 14 years ago, yeah, right, right at the very beginning. Uh, as time moved along, we, we thought, uh, now, we, we've got to overcome the, the, the evil with good, and so we tried to, to outline a program of agricultural missionary activity that we could reach out to the people and be a blessing to them. Uh, I had graduated from ag college and, of course, knew all of the answers to all of the agricultural problems, you know, and uh, I was ready to uh, just spout information any time, but I wasn't quite prepared to cope with the actual problems of farming myself. 
So every morning our missionary activity consisted of getting up on the top store and looking out to see what our neighbors were doing, and we did the same thing. Uh, if they were plowing, we plowed. If they were planting, we planted. And for a year or two, we were that kind of agricultural missionaries, absorbing all that we could from our environment. I remember on one occasion, uh, I had learned I, in college how, how, to, how to farm scientifically. And uh, unfortunately, the mule that we had hadn't had the same course that I had. He, he didn't know anything about scientific farming. And I was trying to get him hitched up one day, and uh, there was a neighbor watching me, and the old mule just wouldn't stand still. I couldn't get the bridle on him. I couldn't get the collar on him. I couldn't get the hamstring tied, and on and on it went. And finally, this neighbor farmer said, You know, Zed, I don't think a preacher ought to have to plow a mule. I said, Why not? Well, he said, a preacher ain't supposed to cuss. I said, man, what do you think I had two years of Hebrew for? <laughs> well, uh, as we moved on, we, we did learn a lot about agriculture, and we began to put, began to put our, our theory and our practice together. We became more and more skilled, and we introduced uh, uh, scientific poultry farming into that area. We were the first ones to have a commercial flock in that area. Uh, we uh, wrote off to a man up in Virginia and told him we were trying to introduce a better strain of poultry in that area, and we wanted the finest chickens he had. So he said, yeah, I'm interested in that. And we'd send him a check uh, for 50 biddies, 50 little chicks, and we'd devise a little homemade brooder that would take care of 50. And uh, he said, I want to give you the chicks. So when they came... Much to my amazement, instead of it being uh, 50 chicks, it was 500. Well, you can imagine that for a while it was like old MacDonald's farm. It was here yeah, chick, that chick, everywhere chick, chick. Uh, we raised those chicks all the way from babyhood on up to uh, uh, ladyhood, womanhood, I guess you'd call it. They were all pullets. Uh, we did have a few casualties. Uh, we lost about six one night when I crawled into bed and crushed them. I, uh, <laughs> and uh, several went to roost in the oven, and my wife baked them without knowing they were in there. I uh, built a fire in there. But we had good luck, and uh, later on, those, those hens began to lay. Uh, I never saw anything shell out like they did. They'd just line up to get on the nest. And people would come from all around to see those uh, chickens lay. They'd never seen anything like that before. One old farmer... Uh, said, I, 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 I want to see those uh, uh, patented nests y'all got down here. I said, patented nests? Yeah, he said, I, 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 I hear y'all got some patented nests. I said, no, come on out and look at them. So we went out to check an eye, and he said, that, 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 ain't, that ain't the kind of nest they told me y'all had. I said, what kind did they tell you we had? He said, well, they said y'all had a nest here that had a, a sloping bottom to it and a little chute at the back. And said, oh, him would sit down and lay, and the egg would roll down the nest into the chute and then hide into the basket. Then the old hen would get up and look all around and wouldn't see the egg and think she hadn't laid and sit down and lay again. <laughs> well, uh, well, anyway, as a result of that, the, the, uh, the poultry uh, idea spread, and now uh, our section is one of the largest egg-producing centers uh, in the state. When we moved into Georgia 14 years ago, uh, Georgia was importing approximately 19 million dozen eggs from other states, and uh, now it's coming pretty close to meeting its, uh, its supply. Another thing that we thought we could do was to introduce uh, better dairy cattle into that area. Uh, there were quite a few uh, uh, coffee cows running around down there. You all raise those cows up here? You know what kind of cow a coffee cow is? That's a cow that gives just enough milk for a cup of coffee. Uh, uh, another thing that we noticed was that there were a lot of, of Negro families, particularly with a lot of children, and uh, not a milk cow anywhere around. So the idea occurred to us that perhaps we could set up a, a cow library. Uh, where a family could come and check it, check out a milk cow and take it home and uh, keep her until she went dry and bring her back and check out another one. So for a number of years, we operated the most unique library I know about. It was a cow library. Our, uh, 
we also had, along that time, we were having our difficulties, particularly because of the race situation. One, uh, one neighbor, uh, about three or four miles from us, uh, was very bitterly opposed to us, had fought us all the way, tooth and toenail, until one day he had a, an outbreak of blackleg in his cattle. Now, blackleg is something that kills very quickly, and the only uh, cure for it is inoculation. Uh, the county agent was away, the veterinarians were away, he couldn't get anybody to do it, and somebody told him we could do it. Well, he, he came with his head hanging down very apologetically and asked if we could do that job for him. Well, I went and inoculated his cattle when it was over. He said, well, how much owe you? I said, well, not a thing, not a thing. He said, well, I want to pay you. I said, it's our privilege to do it for you. You mean you do it for me for nothing? Certainly. You of all people for nothing. Well, it, it seemed to touch him, and he couldn't understand how, how somebody who had opposed us as bitterly as he had would be responded to. And uh, now he, he, is, he is one of our, our closest friends. Another group took it up soon after that, and that was the uh, local Baptist church. Uh, we, up until this time, we had all been members of the church trying to work within it and to bring it around uh, to an attitude of, of, uh, of love and of brotherhood. We had never pressed our views, uh, but had always been quite outspoken about them. Uh, one time, a, a student from India visited us, and... Uh, he became very much interested in koinonia and interested in Christianity and asked if he could go to church with us. We took him to church and people uh, somehow mistook him for a Negro and uh, the church became incensed and the following Sunday uh, a resolution was introduced by the deacons of the church excluding all who were members of koinonia from membership in the Rehoboth Baptist Church. My wife was the only one of Koinonia people there, and the accusations were that, that we uh, had had Negroes, we had eaten with Negroes, that we had visited Negro churches, and that we had brought uh, a member of the Negro race into that church, contrary to its practices and policies, and had broken up its spirit of unity and Christian fellowship. Therefore, they said, uh, we recommend that these ones be excluded from membership. Uh, my wife got up and said, I'd like to make a motion that those recommendations be adopted. Well, the people who were against us didn't want to vote Willa, and those who were... Uh, 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 and those who were for us didn't want to vote for the recommendation. Uh, it was a church that was quite torn when the preacher called for the vote. My wife immediately stood in favor of turning herself and the rest of us out on those charges. And the rest of the people, some who had gathered the first time in 15 or 20 years, had heard there was to be a big scrap going on there, uh, begun to wonder how they should vote. Uh, they couldn't see themselves standing with her, and yet they were anxious for the motion to carry. Finally, a few people struggled to their feet, and uh, then he called for all of those opposed, and nobody stood, and he said, I declare the motion carried. Well, at that time, uh, everybody got quiet, and then they got a little bit more quiet, and then they got a little bit more quiet until finally there was just kind of a, a suspension of animation, it seemed, there. Animation. And for perhaps several minutes, it was as though everyone was even afraid to breathe. And then someone started sobbing, and then another, and then another. And for about five minutes, the whole church just sat there weeping. And then, very quietly, they, one by one, they got up and tiptoed out and 
got in their cars and went home. On Wednesday, the chairman of the Board of Deacons, who had drawn up the resolution, came down to Cornelia, called me aside, and he said, Brother Jen, I want to talk to you. He said, there's an awful lot of tension in the community. I don't know what's going to happen. There might be some physical harm before you and your family. He said, I've heard you're going away speaking somewhere, and I came down to ask you not to leave until things die down a little bit. And I promised him I would not. And then he started to go away, and I saw he was still tremendously concerned about something. And I said, Mr. Bourne, is there anything else on your mind? And he said, oh, well, nothing specially. I said, well, kind of unspecially. Is there anything bothering you? Well, he said, yes, there is. He said, you know, I, I haven't slept a wink since since Sunday. So I've heard the clock strike every hour of the day and night. I said, what's your trouble? Well, he said, I, I go to bed and I, I lay there and toss and roll for hours. And then he said, if I do nod or doze, so somebody comes in the room and they start singing and it, it just wakes me so wide awake. I, I just can't go back to sleep. And if I do doze off again, they come back and start singing. And it just wakes me up again. He said, I've heard the clock strike every hour. I said, can you make out what it is they're singing? Oh, yes, he said. And then he started weeping, just weeping profusely. I said, what is it? He says, it's it's, uh, it's, were you there when they crucified my Lord? And in the midst of his tears, he said, Brother Jared and I was there. And worse than that, I was helping do it. And he said, I came down here to ask you to please forgive me. Well, I put out my hand and I said, man, I grew up in this section. I know how people feel about it. I forgave you before it ever happened. He said, you mean it? I said, from my heart, I mean it. Well, then, will you pray that God will forgive me? I said, no, I won't pray that. He said, why not? Well, I said, because when you felt you had sinned against me, you didn't send anybody. You came yourself and you asked for forgiveness and you got it. Now, don't send me to plead your case before God. You do it. He said, I'll do it. Let's do it now. And so we knelt down, and he asked God to forgive him. And when he got up, he took my hand and squeezed it tight. He said, Brother Jordan, I want you to know I'm sticking with you. Now, he said, what must I do? He said, I, I, I must go back up there and take my letter out of the church. I can no longer be a member of that church. And this was the chairman of the board of deacons who just turned us out there. Yeah? We hadn't argued with him. We hadn't even said anything to him. It had no conduct. I said, no, sir, I don't want you to take your letter out of that church. He said, but I can't be a member of a church that won't let you be a member of it. I said, well, I appreciate that, but I want you to go back up there and so live as to get kicked out. <laughs> well, he got, got, got the point. He said, I'll do it, and he went back and... If ever there was a divine irritant, he was one. He, he gave him the works for the next year or so until he, until he died. He was a very old uh, man at that time. Lived about a year afterwards. And he certainly preached the gospel to those people that we would never have been able to have done. Well, we, uh, even after we were turned out, we thought we still should go right on back and still try to overcome evil with good. And uh, the next Sunday... We were right back in our places, as usual. And uh, we figured that mechanical membership didn't mean anything. What does it matter if you don't have your name on the books? It didn't bother us, so we went right on back. Go on back. Well, uh, th Thursday or Friday of the, that sun after that Sunday, the preacher came down, and he says... Uh, I won't ask you to never come back to this church anymore at all. I thought when we turned you out, you could have caught the hen. And uh, uh, I said, "Well, now, now, Reverend, uh, uh, what's what's our charge? What's our sin now? What is our charge? What have we done? 
Oh, he said nothing except that we turned you out and we thought you ought to stay away. Well, saints, we knew we need the gospel in either event. We ought to be there. <laughs> Might classify us as either. And, uh, uh, said, I just won't ask you to stay away anyway. So, uh, we agreed that if he would let us come back one more Sunday and tell the people why we were staying away, that it was not because we were angry with them, that we were not miffed, our feelings were not hate, but that we would stay away simply out of consideration for a preacher who could not preach with us in the audience, that we would stay away. Well, he said, can't you just withdraw without making that statement? Uh, I said, well, no, no, we couldn't because we want the light to be turned on them. He finally agreed, and so that next Sunday we made that statement to the congregation and uh, since then have not been in attendance at, at the church. Uh, many, of, many of the people came around afterwards with statements saying, well, we want you to know that they might keep you out of the church, but they can't keep you out of our homes and out of our hearts. We want you to come to see us. I tell you that not to reflect bad or evil on any, anyone except to show you the tremendous struggle going on in the hearts of Southern people. I don't think they are vicious devils. I think they are people with the good and the evil, and it's pulling against them. Uh, they, there is this struggle between an ideal and a, and a tradition that that's exerts a tremendous pull in their lives. They want to do what they know Christ teaches, and yet they are not strong enough to break with the traditions uh, in which they found themselves. Well, that brings us then to uh, something of our present situation, and then I, I shall give you opportunity to, to raise some questions about that. Here, yeah, several months ago, I was asked to come to Atlanta uh, to help some Negro students get some courses that they were unable to get in, in any of the Negro colleges. Uh, I talked with them and found that they were absolutely sincere. They had gone as far as they could. They were not out to test any law or anything. They simply wanted the courses. Their, their plan was to get in line the next day at the Georgia Business College for white people and just try to register like any other normal American citizen would. Well, that had much to commend it, but I, I felt that it would be much better to go first to the president of this college, tell him what the problem was, and see if he couldn't find some answer to it. We went to his office. He received us very graciously. We laid the problem before him, and uh, he said, I, I sympathize with you. I hope we can work out something. And uh, he called in the registrar. Well, the registrar immediately saw that uh, it might set off a... Uh, a bomb, and he said, uh, no, we just can't, can't accept. He just put his foot down on it. Well, the president then suggested that we go over to the uh, chairman of the Board of Regents of the university system and talk with him. The president called him up, made an appointment for us, and we started over to his office. Before we left, we promised the president of the college that we would not make any public statement, that we would uh, bring out no publicity whatsoever about it. Just as we stepped out of his office, the whole vestibule was jumping with photographers and reporters. I don't know how they'd gotten hold of it, but flash bulbs going off everywhere and reporters wanting to know this and that. Well, we went over to talk to the uh, chairman of the Board of Regents, and uh, he uh, was also very sympathetic, but uh, felt that, um, that it was something he'd have to take up with the board. I then left to go back to America, and before I could get back, I found that the governor of Georgia had already called up the sheriff down there to find out what this Jordan fellow was up to, and uh, the headlines of the America's paper came out with the fact that an America's man was trying to get two Negro students into the university system of Georgia. Well, that night, uh, all kinds of anonymous threatening phone calls came through, cars came by uh, shooting. Uh, a shot was fired into our roadside market, and uh, it looked like uh, we were going to have a hot time in the old town that night. Well, uh, uh, shortly after that, our roadside market was dynamited. A uh, considerable charge of dynamite was thrown into it and blew the top and sides uh, off of it, doing considerable damage. 
And then came, started uh, an avalanche of insurance cancellations. Every insurance policy that we had was canceled. And uh, then the, the boycott began, uh, people refusing to sell to us. Now, this has been the most uh, difficult thing of all to deal with. It, it's fairly easy to, uh, uh, to fight a, uh, an enemy that, that you can, uh, can meet, but it's hard to fight uh, the, the strangling uh, economic uh, pressures that are brought against you. Somebody said that 20th century people no longer uh, feed Christians to the lions. They just don't feed them. Uh, just try to, to cut the economic groups. And uh, I could go on and on telling you how one business after another has, has refused to do business with us, not because we are bad risk, not because we've had unpleasant business relationships at all, but each one thing, now understand, there's nothing personal with me. I think the world of you people, but it's, it's either my business or, or else. I, I, so many people are saying they won't trade with me if, if I continue to supply you with poultry feed or gas or something like that. And I have repeatedly put it up to them, well, you are facing exactly the same question we are facing. And they always ask right off the bat, well, uh, are you... Uh, are you a member of the church? Yes, I, I'm a Baptist down there. Everybody who isn't either a Methodist or Baptist, somebody's been tinkering with him. It's uh, <laughs> uh, uh, taken for granted that you, you just kind of like the state church. You grow up in it down there. Well, uh, uh, always I, I say you're facing the same question we are. Will you be true to your convictions or will you sell out for your business? Now, I, I said to this fellow who was supplying us with gas and oil, we know how to do business in Georgia. We know how to be popular. We know how to break this boycott. All we've got to do is get up on the courthouse square and yell nigger a few times and holler white supremacy and, and go the rounds. We know the language, and we know how to do the business. But uh, with us, it's a question of whether we will be true to, to the highest and noblest regardless of the cost ourselves, and that's your problem, too. And I said to him, now, now, when this thing is over, will you be more satisfied having lost a good bit of business, maybe all of your business, maybe having to move into a little wretch of a home, but having stood by that which is right, would you feel better that way or when it's all over? to feel that you've sold your principal and sold your friends and sold your soul for a little bit of business profit. But as yet, I haven't found the businessman in our county who's made that decision. Nor have I found the professional man. There is one minister, just one, who is trying to make it, and he's having one hard time. The other ministers have sold out. The lawyers fell like a bunch of tin pins. Even my own brother, when a good bit of legal pressure was brought against us, I went to my brother Bob and said, Bob, we've got to have some help. I showed him this injunction and various other legal papers that had been brought against us. He said, Clarence, these charges are not at all uh, true. He said, they are trumped up things. He said, "They've got this. It's a it's a stack case." I said, "I know it is. I don't need any legal advice to point that out to me." He said, "They after you because of your stand on the race question." I said, "That's right. Now that's why I need you, a Baptist deacon and a lawyer, to 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 help us in this situation." He said, "Well, now I'll give you all the advice you want, but I cannot accept the case." But Bob, I said, "Aren't you a a Christian?" Oh, well, yes. Don't you follow Jesus? Well, yes, up to a point. Would that point by any means be the cross? Yeah, yeah, up to the cross. I said, Bob, I, I admire your frankness in this situation but I seriously question your discipleship. For Jesus has said, except a man take up his cross and follow me, he cannot be my disciple. Now, I think in all honesty, you ought to go to church next Sunday. 
and tell the people you are not a follower of Jesus Christ. Well, he said, if all of us did it, there wouldn't be anybody left in the church. Well, maybe there wouldn't. Maybe we could get along without those kind of churches anyway. I don't know. But he said, Clarence, if I were to take that stand, I'd lose my home, I'd lose my practice, I'd lose my business. I said, yes, I know all that. You'd lose the same things we're having to lose. Then you could come on to Koinonia and join us, for our requirement is that you have nothing. You'd be a prime candidate for membership. <laughs> and then we could be true brothers, not just brothers in the flesh, but brothers in the spirit. He said, I'm not prepared to take that stand. Well, we finally did succeed in getting one lawyer in Atlanta to take the case, and he has certainly stood by us. I should take that back. I, I meant there were no professional men in the county outside of this one minister who has taken the stand. Um, well, I, I need not go into all of it. It has taken uh, several forms. One has been the physical part of it, such as the dynamiting, shooting, and so forth on one occasion. I was coming home over a rather lonely country road, and a truck blocked the road over a little one-way bridge. I noticed what was going on, and so had slowed down considerably up the road as I came around the curve, and when I saw the gentleman get out with a shotgun, I, uh, I remembered Jesus' injunction that when they persecute you in this city, flee to the next, you know, and... Uh, I also remember that if a man smites you on your right cheek, turn to him both heels, and uh, I, uh, uh, I, I, put, uh, I put it in reverse and backed out of that situation very quickly. I, I didn't see any point in arguing with a man who could win the argument with a slight pressure of his forefinger. Uh, now, he could have just been squirrel hunting, I don't know. Uh, I don't know why he'd be parked in that particular place to hunt squirrels, but uh, I didn't ask him about it. I don't even know whether he shot or not. I was, pa I was traveling at supersonic speeds, and the sound probably wouldn't have reached me anyway. So, uh, well, the, uh, the, the physical side of it has somewhat died down now, but the, the legal and economic side of it still continues very, very severe. Uh, it's almost impossible now for us to either buy or sell our products anywhere in the county. We have to just go outside of it where we're not either not known or where the pressure has not been applied to people who deal with us. And uh, the state of Georgia has applied all of its legal machinery of uh, every department to try to get rid of us. Uh, they're trying now to... Uh, to get rid of our, in, our corporate charter, and uh, whether or not we can exist as a corporation there any longer, I just don't know. Uh, time will tell about that. I have talked, uh, I know, too long and too ramblingly. Maybe you would like to ask uh, just a question or two, or is our time completely gone? After Mr. Jordan's story of Koinonia, a number of questions were asked. We shall hear his comment on two of them. The first concerns Koinonia's children's camp. We started the camp actually a number of years ago back in just a, a vacation Bible school for, for local children, and we felt that that was not intensive enough, and we wanted uh, children to come where we could have them over a long period of intensive training. And... Um, so last year, the idea occurred to us that we could put up some tents and invite children in, particularly from the cities, get them out in the country where they could see what a cow looks like and what a hog looks like and uh, let them feel a little fresh, fresh cloud dirt and, uh, and breathe the fresh country air. And uh, we had a wonderful camp. It was about half uh, white and half Negro, uh, attended by half white and half Negro children. And um, everything went off smoothly. Uh, it was for children from 8 to 12, 8 years old to 12, both boys and girls. Uh, this year, when we started to have it, we had expanded our facilities so as to take care of more children, and um, 
That was when an injunction was served against us, restraining us from having it because of health uh, and sanitation grounds. Uh, they claimed that these children might be coming from the cities and even from outside of Georgia, and they might bring uh, diseases that didn't exist in Georgia, and that the people traveling on the highway might catch some epidemic from those, those children. That was actually in the injunction and that it would be a, a health menace and endanger the life and health of the entire county. Now, that's how terrible it was to bring children from outside of the state into Georgia uh, without a thorough inspection you know, and everything. So uh, the county health engineer came out and made a thorough inspection of its place and didn't find anything uh, that was all like that. And well, I needn't go into all that story. It finally rocked on until they did succeed in uh, keeping us from having it in Georgia, but they didn't keep us from having it because it was simply moved across the state line into Tennessee, and we went right on with it. Now, uh, we plan to have it in Tennessee again next year. We don't see how we could possibly have it in Georgia uh, this, this, uh, this summer. Would you tell them about the threat to the children tomorrow? Oh, yeah. Uh, when it looked like the county it didn't have any charge at all after the health inspector had made his inspection, the county was about to drop it, and uh, some of the people were afraid that we might open the camp anyway, even though we had already moved it to Tennessee. They were afraid we might bring it back to Georgia. So four farmers asked to intervene in the case, saying that they wanted to bring charges, not that the camp would be a health menace, but that it would be a moral menace that it would endanger the morals of the children who might attend. And um, the reason for it, they said, was that some of the children might see baby pigs being born on the farm. Now, <laughs> uh, we, we raise a lot of pigs. Uh, you'll notice from our price list, we sell hams. And uh, we have over 50 uh, mother pigs that give birth there uh, during camp season in the summer, along in July. Well, um... At the hearing, the county attorney had me on the stand under oath, and he asked me uh, what kind of degrees I had, and I told him I had a degree in agriculture from the University of Georgia. And uh, he said, well, uh, it seems to me that a man of your learning uh, should be able to answer this question. Don't you believe that it is immoral to allow children to see baby pigs being born? And I said... Uh, I cannot believe that it is immoral without accusing God of immorality because he had the idea. I didn't. <laughs> now he said, did, uh, did, you ever, did you ever belong to any organization when you were a kid that let you see such a thing as that? And I said, yes, sir. He said, what was it? And I guess he thought I was going to say the Communist Party or something like that. I said, the 4-H Club. <laughs> He said, well, why would you let children do it? Why, why would you let them see it? And I said, well, the main reason is that, that our hogs are somewhat stupid, and we have been unable to train them correctly in the art of etiquette to seclude themselves during that act, and that uh, we have read all of the latest books on swine raising, and we have read all of the bulletins from the Georgia Experiment Station." And we have not yet found any improved method of obtaining new pigs except through the process of birth. <laughs> well, the, the injunction was dropped. The gist of the second question Mr. Jordan will comment on was this. You imply that you are optimistic about the future. Don't you sometimes feel a little pessimistic? Uh, we're not pessimistic about it, no. Uh, just before I left, uh, just a few hours before I left, I learned that uh, a petition was being circulated through Americas and the county uh, asking us to leave the county. Now, I don't know whom they are petitioning. If they're petitioning us, well, we can disregard it. Uh, the only one I know that the petition would have any effect on would be God. That's where we get our orders from, and uh, I don't think he'll give them much of a hearing. So uh, 
I, I I don't know of anything to do but stay. Now, uh, I don't know under what conditions we might... I don't think we've, we've seen the, the end of this thing by any means. But uh, some very important battles have already been won, I think. And... Uh, if we can if we can see it through financially, I, I think we've got a pretty good chance. That that's the big battle right now. And it's quite a hard job to make a living just farming without all of these other obstacles. But for every everything that the opposition is thrown at us, somehow uh, New things have opened up. They, they uh, practically stopped the local trade with the roadside market, but now through peacemakers and others, a mail order business is developing. And I don't think that even the most rabid of the local rabble rousers can stop Uncle Sam's mail from from going right on. I know that we are not an isolated little phenomenon down there. I know that we are part of a whole worldwide surge toward this kind of thing and uh, we feel ourselves borne up on a tide of, of, of a world movement that, that's going on. <laughs>